Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Hip Hop Archive, founded by Marcelina Morgan. Right there. Give it up for Marcelina Morgan. <laughs> Alvin has uh, turned the air conditioner on because it's hot in here. Uh, Linda Haywood, how are you doing? So we're going to have a um, panel discussion. I'm in a kind of echo. Where's the sound person? Is that all right? OK, great. And then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. And then we'll go upstairs and you can see the exhibition. Um, but before we start, we'll be, uh, the session will be introduced by our colleague, Suzanne Blier, who is professor of uh, African and African American studies and the history of art. Suzanne. Thank you. Shall I come around? Or? You can do whatever, wherever you want. Okay. Oh, great. Good. Oh, here. She's on her way to us. Just, it didn't need to be turned off. Great. Well, welcome, everybody. And um, it's, it's wonderful to be back and to be introduced to this amazing uh, discussion this afternoon and exhibit um, here at the Hip Hop Center. Uh, the three panelists absolutely need no introduction. Uh, Henry Louis Gates is, I won't go into it, uh, <laughs> everywhere and involved in everything. And it's so extraordinary that he's been responsible for bringing this wonderful exhibit here. Uh, Alexandro de la Fuente uh, teaches in the history department of the University of Pittsburgh. He's a specialist in Latin American and Caribbean art, but his interests and writings cross between a wide variety of questions having to do with the Black Atlantic. Um, he's published on Havana and the Atlantic in the 16th century, a work that came out in 2008 from the University of North Carolina Press. Uh, uh, he's also, uh, in recent years, he's been editor of a volume um, uh, concerned with questions of uh, uh, debate. Uh, he wrote also an uh, edited work on the nation for all race, inequality, and politics in 20th century Cuba, and is published in a series of journals. Among these, the Journal of Latin American Studies, a work on new Afro-Cuban cultural movement and the debate on race in contemporary Cuba. 2008, and the American Historical Review, uh, a um, essay on slaves and the creation of legal rights in Cuba. He's won various awards, including the Chancellor's Distinguished Research Award in 2006, and for his uh, work on Latin American and Caribbean uh, um, uh, writing in The Nation for All, he won the Latin and American Caribbean section of the Southern Historical Association Prize in 2003. I'm also very pleased to introduce Elio Rodriguez, who is an artist of uh, striking importance and striking interest. He did his um, studio work and study in Havana, Cuba, and has also participated in a number of residencies, uh, both uh, there and in the United States, from Buffalo, New York, to Tufts, and Medford, Massachusetts, uh, to a participation in the ceramics workshop uh, here at Harvard. He's also participated in a number of personal shows, ranging from Havana to Buffalo to Pittsburgh to London, an array of collaborative exhibits from Spain to Argentina, Mexico, Haiti, Belgium, uh, Vienna. And his works are uh, a part of collections uh, in places ranging from D.C. to New York to Madrid to London. What's particularly striking about his works, and I think makes his participation in this uh, particularly appealing, is his focus on an array of issues concerned with identity. Uh, identity of person, of culture, of place, and the larger phenomenon that are framed around this. He also explores the cross-currencies and paradoxes, the ambivalences between genres, uh, and explores ideas of identity and spectatorship from these various vantages. His works are intriguing for their sensory dimensions, but also the ways in which he brings different media into play in relationship uh, to his various ideas, his media interests spanning posters to paintings to sculptures uh, to, to prints uh, and various ceramics. 
To me, what's also engaging is the way that he crosses between issues of craft and issues of art, moving um, uh, uh, undauntingly between so-called high and low in exploring the cross-currencies between these various uh, forms. So it's a real pleasure to welcome you all here, and uh, we all look forward to this wonderful discussion. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> Great. Well, let's get started. Alejandro, um, can you tell us a little bit about the history of Kiloides? Um, there were three previous manifestations in Havana between 1997 and 1999. How did the exhibitions uh, in the U.S., Pittsburgh, and then New York, and then here, um, compare to the, its previous incarnations in Havana? The, um, the history of this particular exhibit is, um, is very much linked to those previous exhibits. Uh, what happened was that in the 1990s, a group of uh, then very young, not so young anymore, sorry, <laughs> Elio, uh, Cuban visual artists, they began to use art to talk about race, not about African influences in Cuban culture, which was a topic which was already fairly prominent in Cuban art. But they began to talk about race. They began to talk about discrimination. They began to talk about topics that were unspeakable in Cuban public and official culture. Um, so in 1997, they organized the first exhibit. Uh, you have uh, the brochure there, a very modest exhibit, uh, and a second, much larger exhibit, this Keloides, in 1999. The interesting thing about these two exhibits is that although they were path-breaking, from my point of view anyways, they were not recorded anywhere. They, are, they were ghost exhibits. Uh, they, are not, they were not inscribed uh, in the annals of Cuban art. You could not find references to these exhibits in any of the best books, and there are many, of Cuban art in the 1990s. They just didn't happen. And there were very few references to them in the Cuban press. So it was almost impossible to know what had happened in those exhibits. There were very few images, a few scattered images in the internet. So my, I, I became attracted to the exhibits as a scholar of race and racism in Cuba. And basically, I began the task of reconstructing those exhibits and sort of putting them back together. And in that process, I ran across Elio in Madrid in 2006 or 2007. You were he, just walking down the street and you ran into <laughs> him? <or>? Well, <laughs> more or less, actually. <laughs> he was doing a wonderful exhibit at Casa de America in the, in the center of Madrid. And I came to see him. And we began a conversation about Keloides. We organized a solo exhibit for Elio in Pittsburgh. And we began collaborating to uh, put Keloides together again. I have to say that I felt the need to do this also, because the person who had taken uh, up this project, the late Ariel Ribodiago, uh, had died and died a very premature death. Uh, therefore, I felt that somebody needed to uh, take this project and continue uh, the Keloides project. So he was the first curator? Was he, was the, he was the curator of, the, this, of the second Keloides and of a, an intermediate exhibit which was called Ni Musico Ni Deportista, Neither Musician Nor Athletes. Mm -hmm. And that title is, uh, is, is clear enough. So he was developing the project that Alexis Esquivel and Omar Pascual Castillo had begun in 1997. But it stopped after 1999. And we felt that there was a need to bring these artists together and to reinitiate a conversation that had been, frankly, silenced. Well, as I understand it, Kiloides is the first exhibition in the history of Cuba since the revolution, at least, to have the word racism in its title. Is that right? That is right. So the word Kiloides can be translated into English as a thick ray scar that develops from a serious wound. And we all know that if you have melanin in your, in your skin, scarring can be quite dramatic. Um, how does this exhibition illustrate the persistence of racial stereotypes, and indeed of anti-black racism in Cuba. Is that what it's primarily about? Or is it about bringing um, artists of color um, to the public? It's about, I think it's primarily about, um, it's primarily about first the need to talk about race and about uh, prejudice and stereotypes. And not so much, there were always artists of color 
in the Cuban uh, art scene. Uh, although, in many cases, you could never guess from their work. Uh, the, the, what was interesting about this generation of scholars, and these are all people who came to age like in the early 1990s. So right at the moment in which Cuban society, the Cuban welfare state, is falling apart with a special period and the crisis after the fall of the Soviet Union, all this. Explain to people what the special period is. Most people won't know. This moment of huge crisis in Cuba during the 1990s after, um, after the end of Soviet subsidies, which had, uh, which had financed generous, very generous social programs in Cuba, which were mostly egalitarian. So I think this is a, gener this is a generation of artists that uh, grow up in what was, for the most part, let me say that again, for the most part, a fairly egalitarian social environment, a fairly just social environment. And then they witnessed how this social environment collapsed and disintegrated in front of their eyes in the 1990s, while at the same time not having outlets to really express their outrage or their concerns or their anxieties about uh, the reappearance, the reemergence of race as a major, major cleavage in, social, uh, in Cuban society. Perhaps nothing illustrates that anxiety better than this painting uh, from the early 2000s by Armando Marinho, in which he is literally crying for help. But there is a lot of that in the work of these artists. They were trying desperately to call attention to the fact that racism was a reality in Cuban society and that we had to talk about it. And that's the beauty of art. You can, in art, you can talk about unspeakable topics. Uh, things that are not speakable in other realms become uh, possible in the realm of art. Mm. Elio? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that Alejandro said. I mean, was a concern about the Cuban artists, the young Cuban artists at the time, that race was a, a fact in Cuba, uh, and also I think also because it was not only uh, Afro descendants, uh, Cuban artists who was in those shows, was also white people working on. Because the point is, what was the image that Cuban society had about this, the, the phenomenon? And that, that, that uh, image was not only about Cuban, uh, about uh, Afro descendant, was also everybody in Cuban, like white, or any color. And um, I think was so, w one one point on the the all, every, every, all the curator that was always on the project was very uh, on the first level, and um, and I think was uh, actually was very good in the way that uh, that allowed us from the point of view of the government that don't don't mark of a, of a, of a Negro shows mm -hmm. was a show that belonged with everybody, mm -hmm. and I think that was a really good thing. There's a famous debate in the history of uh, black Americans between uh, poets, artists, and it was epitomized in the middle of the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s between Langston Hughes and County Cullen. Mm -hmm. And County Cullen said he didn't want to be described as a Negro poet. He just wanted to be a poet who happened to be Negro. And Langston Hughes said he was a Negro poet. Are you a black artist? Well, Are you a Cuban artist? Are you a Spanish artist? Are you an artist? Um, uh, that's tricky, but I think I'm an artist, but I'm Cuban mm -hmm. and a black artist that, that come together. You can separate that. Mm -hmm. And I might be sparty sometimes, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but the point is you can renounce, you can, you, can, you can put apart the thing you are. You have to, have to accept everything you got as a Cuban, as an artist, as, 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 a, as a black artist. I mean, you have to be proud of the thing you are because you can't you can hide it. Yeah, and and that, that, that's the point. I mean, in, maybe in, in Cuban art, the, in one point that was it the concern that people want to be labeled as an artist. People don't want to be labeled as a, as a, as a, as a black artist because, because people, we, I mean, have to even put them in the, in the box. We're afraid that to be labeled as a black artist can be put apart. Mm -hmm. of the main streets. So everybody was really concerned about it. Uh, so I think that the good thing about this project is that the curators always have been, this is the project of curators, that curators have been always the first to push uh, artists to, to lend their work to, to speak uh, about this, this subject. Because, I mean, we, we never change our work to make 
to, to be on the, on the show. Mm -hmm. We use the current work that we will uh, show in, in, in any kind of shows around the world. Mm -hmm. But the point I think that the curator that, that was uh, Ariel and, and Alejandro, and that they, they, they choose the kind of work that, that, that you can see more easy, easily the, um, the, uh, the thing that they want to talk about the racial Cuba. Elio, do you see your work primarily as, or first, about critiquing racism? Or about expressing sort of um, what in negritude they call the racial soul, or is it just personal? Is just about Elio Rodriguez? I'm a I'm a I'm a mix of things, so I can't put anything in one level. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. I don't I don't have a, a first level. I have a lot of levels, but I don't have I don't have first one or second one. Everything is in the same level, in my case. I think. Okay, Alejandro, what are the themes of the exhibition? Well, you know, it's interesting that Elio was saying that sometimes it was just their current work and they were not, you know, some of, some of their messages were not so subtle, uh, uh, as I hope you can see. Um, it, I mean, it, it didn't really take a rocket scientist to use an American expression to see this one, right? I mean, the, the, for instance, as I began to see some of these images uh, in the late 1990s and I became fascinated with their work, I saw, for instance, that work piece after piece, uh, the, the stereotype, the, the whole ideology, uh, this whole gendered image of the black male predator was everywhere, you know, beware of the black man. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't get more explicit than that. And then, as you can see, uh, this is a painter who, who doesn't understand why he's being stopped by the police all the time, why he's being treated as a dangerous character. It's, and then he asks here on, the, on his palette, por qué? Why? Why, are, why am I dangerous? What makes me dangerous? Now, if you listen to Cuban, we are the hip hop archive. If you listen to Cuban hip hop from these years, the young musicians are asking exactly the same question. Is why do you stop me in the streets every day? Why can I not walk through Havana without being stopped? Um, that, um, that ideology, that image is very much present in, in, in much of the work uh, of René Peña, as I hope this image illustrates uh, beautifully, in fact. Uh, and it's also very much part of, uh, of a friend of, of mine who happens to be a great artist and, who, and who's here. So he can talk about, about these pieces, right? Well, I own, I own that one. That's why I chose Good it. Good for you. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> Good. Talk about some of the themes, in, not only in your work in the exhibition, but in uh, that of other artists. I think it's like. I mean, I used to say that it's, it's kind of a revenge, that the, the history, not only our history, is always read by white people, and white people are the heroes of all, all this history. So at some point, I, it's like, if I made the rule of, of my art, I would put myself as a hero, mm -hmm. as the main uh, people. We can see, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, no, but it's all, I mean, yeah. No, but for example, that this uh, the mo that movie going with, with the wing is a very race uh, racist movie. It's mm -hmm. like the anti anti uh, black people movie, mm -hmm. and for me it was really <laughs> funny to put myself up a hero in that. that uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was funny. I gotta be the guy. guy <laughs> like, that was the first version I made in nineteen ninety five. That also is like playing with the uh, name, going with the uh, what I, the, what the macho take off. Yeah, and. The first one I put a mulata, a Cuban woman, mm -hmm. on the uh, on the scene, and the thing around was more uh, talking about uh, 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 Cuban culture. But after ten years, I was the one that made this one. Uh, situation in Cuba was changed, and the, the desired object of the Cuban people no, no longer uh, the mulata, the Cuban woman, was the foreign. Mm -hmm. So I put myself uh, taking a one, taking one. <laughs> and it's the same that, like the Tarzan. It's all these old classic uh, icons of the culture that always a white people who is in the center. So I say, why not? Can be me right now. Star. <laughs> so to some extent, I mean, do you see your art as primarily political? Primarily political. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. Look, I'm, I'm, I always said I'm. I'm a. I'm a. Uh, uh, a boy from Havana Vieja, a very poor neighborhood, very poor family. The only one I want is, is 
enjoy doing the thing I, I, I have. And if somebody wants to buy it, great. But I don't, I mean, it's, I don't, I don't, I mean, I think, but I don't, I don't try to, to intellectualize mm -hmm. too much about the thing I work, I, I made. I just enjoy and, and I don't care if I provide a political or not or, or the, all this, all this, Boxes, uh -huh. I hate it. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I will, I will go and get in the cave to put let me, first on the table. Let me jump in with another theme, which is also major in the work of all of them, um, and illustrate it this way. And that's one of the interesting things they, I think that all these artists have done is to rewrite human history or to begin a process of questioning some of the most ingrained and sacred truths in human history, including the official and beloved narrative of the white uh, slave owner who calls on his slaves in 1868, gives them freedom, Carlos Manuel de Céspedes. This is untouchable guy in Cuban history. He's, he's el padre de la patria, the father of the homeland. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the official narrative, which I have called in my work of uh, white generosity kind of uh, nationalist discourse. Well, this is Alexis Esquivel's take on that, uh, on that discourse. <laughs> Uh, a Cespedes that is a prisoner of his fear of blacks, a, a Cespedes that in truth sees blacks as disorder, music, uh, lack of civilization, uh, a man who doesn't in fact give freedom to anybody, but a man who actually uh, is incapable of transcending his class and racial origins. It's a completely alternative narrative of Cuban uh, history. By the way, that this painting, which is Carlos Manuel de Céspedes, was bought by a descendant of uh, Céspedes, Monsignor Carlos Manuel de Céspedes yeah, of the that's Cuban so he Catholic Church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. But this is another major kind of uh, trope in their work, is to rewrite uh, the history of Cuba. You have to understand, that this is like saying Abraham Lincoln or John mm. Brown right. would be you know, the, the person uh, tied to the stake. So that's a very radical critique. Sure, sure, sure it is. Um, Elio, I wanted to ask you before we go on and talk about the reaction to these, uh, these exhibitions. You said that you were a poor kid growing up. Yeah. Right? So I was working class, you know, upper working class. I guess. My father had two jobs. If I had come home and said, I'm going to be an artist, my parents would have thought I was crazy. Same thing they saw. Because my yeah. mother wanted me to be a doctor, my yeah, father sure. wanted me to be a lawyer, and my brother's an oral surgeon. Yeah, yeah. So what did your parents say when you... Uh, I'm, I was crazy. Yeah, Everybody so was ready to be a, uh, be a, a, a sport man. <laughs> it was my... I mean, uh, they, actually, they put me in a uh, basketball uh, school. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, at that, at that time, being an artist was crazy. It was... Now, right now in Cuba, being an artist uh, is is something that everybody want to be an artist because you make money and that. But at that time, it was crazy. It was crazy. Well, how did you? What, what was your inspiration? I mean, what made you go that way? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, maybe when you you know, when you kid, when you start to paint on the wall, yeah. people say, "Oh, that's beautiful." I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. When don't did know. your parents? When did your parents say, "Okay"? When people outside start to talk on the news on the TV that I was an artist. That was like, oh, my song is that TV. That was great. So la last week, two years ago? No. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting older. <laughs> no, I remember, for example, one time with, with Peña, Rene Peña, we went, we were at the Times Square. I, I never, I, I, I will never forget that. I was, I was in, in Times Square on Sunday, like 10 o'clock, drinking beer for something. And we were... And that time, Rene told me, do you realize that we are a couple very poor uh, uh, guys from Cuba, that our family are very poor, and we are right now in New York drinking beer, and we never want to, to be famous, or we never want to be an artist. We just want to make some art. Mm -hmm. But we never do art expecting to be paid for or be famous for. And look at that, we are not right now here. So I think by some reason we start to do it, and at some point people start to pay us, and that was fine, and we keep doing. But uh, it was, I don't know, it was not inspiration. It was like I, like, I like it. 
Were there art? Are there art classes in? I mean, in the school that you attended, could you study art? Yeah, or sure. you did yeah, it yeah, all yeah. I do all the all the things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Um, Alejandro, I wanted you to be in Black and Latin America, mm -hmm. but uh, you were forbidden from uh, entering the country. So, could you talk about exactly what happened and what the relationship between that prohibition was and your cura curating uh, Kilodes? Yeah, well, the, the prohibition was um, a direct consequence of Caloides. Um, I had been going to Cuba. Actually, I, I have been lately going back to Cuba all the time. And I uh, had been going twice, thrice a year uh, since, well, uh, for many years. But Caloides was a transgression. Um, Organizing Caloides was a transgression uh, because as an intellectual, it, um, it put me in a much more public kind of space. I was not just writing my books and publishing my articles uh, and giving my lectures, but now I was doing something. I was injecting uh, or trying to make a contribution to this conversation about race and racism, which is taking place within Cuba. And you know, trying to inject some energy into that conversation. And I think that's what made some bureaucrats, uh, who are very unimaginative people, very nervous. <laughs> however, however, the point was, the critically important point for us was that the exhibit had to take place in Havana. That this exhibit could not be done just for New York consumption, or for Pittsburgh consumption, or for uh, Cambridge consumption. That this had to take place in Havana. And therefore, I was basically ready to sacrifice whatever I had to sacrifice to make that happen. And as we negotiated with Cuban authorities, the deal was more or less implicitly was, we do the exhibit, but you're not going to see it. And I said, you know what? That is actually fine with me. Because the exhibit is not about me. The exhibit is about these topics, which are so important that they're uh, working on. Um, as it turns out, Cuba being Cuba, we have a say that whoever has a friend has a sugar mill. And I do have many friends in the island, and they interceded with the Minister of Culture, and things ended up uh, changing. Um, but, so you can uh, go back now. So I can go back now. But at that point, they, somebody, because the bureaucracy is not monolithic in Cuba by any means, but mm -hmm. somebody in the, in the bureaucracy thought that this was too much. Mm -hmm. and that I shouldn't be allowed. And that was, that, that's really that story, which is a particularly exciting story. Um, that's a painful story. It is a painful story. Uh, of course it is. I would have loved to see the exhibit that I had organized in Havana. Besides, we had planned all sorts of, you know, roundtables and conversations and conferences. We were going to do uh, sort of a little hip hop festival around the exhibit. I ended up bringing the hip hop artists to Pittsburgh, of all places. <laughs> you know? I mean, Pittsburgh is great, but, but, <laughs> but it ain't Havana, right? <laughs> so. Well, you live in Pittsburgh, and you live in Spain. Spain. Um, has Kiloides had an impact on the shape of contemporary art in Cuba? I think so. I think, uh, yeah. Well, it, that is time that it's difficult to find a big show uh, about Cuban or whatever. And I think Keloide was the first main, big show about Cuban art in like five or ten years. Hmm. Not only in Cuba, outside Cuba. So uh, that, that, that make a lot of attention in Cuba. I mean, also, anyway, in Cuba, if you, if you say that you're going to make a, a show uh, in an in a American museum, everybody want to jump to the uh, car because it's, it's a, an opportunity to, to produce a new work, to show, show your work in a, in a different audition. So everybody want to be uh, on the show, was very excited. I mean, I, and also the fact to, to with uh, Alejandro fa uh, find the Matrix Factory Museum that is a wonderful, it's, a, it's the, uh, the uh, holy grail of the any ideas on the world. It's amazing the place. It's amazing. That we can make and produce our work on that place was I mean everybody wanna be on the show. At the, at the end everybody was fighting against us because the people were saying, I wanna be on the show, I wanna be on the show. Even people that have anything to do with about about the, the subject, but I mean it was 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 great. No matter that after that 
the uh, authorities don't want to uh, talk anything about the project. But you know, there is something interesting about that. I think that all the prohibition and these things around the show actually were a big help. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it's lovely how these things uh, usually happen exactly the, the opposite way that bureaucrats uh, sick uh, as they. They, they, they didn't allow me to go in, and then every day in Pittsburgh I would receive all these emails and news from Havana inviting me to go to the show and saying, <laughs> you know, all, because now there are all these other networks in which mm -hmm. uh, information circulates among artists, uh, uh, students from the School of Art would write, uh, we want to know more about the show, can you send us the proposal, can you send us a project? Um, so in a sense, all these sort of official limitations and prohibitions, I think, actually ended up helping to enhance the visibility and the importance of the show in a twisted uh, sort of way. But why didn't the government prevent you from establishing the exhibition? Instead of just banning you, what was their interest in allowing it to um, be put up? You see what I'm saying? It's sort yeah. of schizophrenic. I it's, it is schizophrenic. Of course it is schizophrenic. but. If they didn't allow the show, they, went, they were then censoring a conversation about race mm -hmm. and racism. And, you know, I, they would have heard from me. I mean, they would have, I would have published an article or two about that. That would have been very explosive within the Cuban cultural context because there are many people talking about this and trying to participate in this conversation. They also had to deal with the artists themselves, mm -hmm. many of whom were committed to the project and wanted the exhibit to happen. And now you can fight with all these people, but these are people with big mouths. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. It's not easy to shut them up, right? So, so in the end, they, they made a calculation. They, 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 they allowed the exhibit to happen and then did everything within their power to uh, pretend that the exhibit didn't exist which, if it had been back in 1999 or 1997, nobody would have noticed. Mm -hmm. But now, with the age of tweeters and emails and all that, forget it. Now it's impossible to silence these things. There are alternative networks of uh, information sharing. Has your art changed? Since, how long have you lived in Spain? Six years? Seven years? Seven years. S seven years. Has, if, if I were writing, a, Suzanne Blier is writing a history of your uh, oeuvre. Would there be the Cuban period and then the Spanish period? Is it, I'm trying to ask, is it easier to be a Cuban artist in Spain than in Havana? And has that made an impact on the nature of your art? Yeah, have made, but uh, um, no. I mean, the only, I mean, the only thing that concerns me sometimes is I'm, oh, I'm always thinking how Cuban could be my art in Spain. Mm -hmm. How much is like, how much my art have to change to keep being Cuban? Mm -hmm. It's like it's like a food. You you got a um, omelet of onion or whatever. And how many things you have to put inside to remind me an omelet mm -hmm. of onion? That's mm -hmm. the thing I do. I I like I put. Uh, some Spanish tradition in my work. I put some American tradition. Mm -hmm. I put whatever tradition I want just to see how much Cuban I could be or not. Mm -hmm. I think it's something you can take off for mm -hmm. anybody. It's the way to think. No matter, no matter the, 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 the uh, thing you use, the way to think will remain to be Cuban. So mm -hmm. I can work with Japanese tradition or American or whatever, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, even if I don't want. Mm -hmm. I will be Cuban because I'm Cuban. That's did you ever see yourself moving back to Cuba? Yeah. Why not? I don't know. I mean, no. Yeah. I mean, why not? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Why not? I mean, no. I mean, I stop. I'm I'm finding any place. I don't. It's it's a, it's a thing that, that I I have a part of my family now in Spain. I have part of my family in Cuba. I still have my, I have I, I got a house in Cuba. So why not? That's a good thing. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> Alejandro, how's the environment for artists in Cuba changed since 1999? How has the environment changed? Yeah, is it palpably different or? Well, I think it other is. Other than I, tweeting and. I, th know, I think it is. I, th I think there is 
I, I actually believe that there has been, uh, there is growing space for art uh, and for artistic expressions in Cuba. Um, first, because the artists themselves have created these spaces. Uh, this is nothing that the government has just given them. The artists from, from below have created these spaces, although maybe that's the social historian in me speaking, right? Um, but also because I think Cuban authorities have come to realize uh, that a painting, however good, doesn't topple a government. That doesn't, it just doesn't have that kind of effect. That there is, that they always, in the past, they would always see art as something that was, they would always see, uh, look at it through a, a, a uniquely political uh, point of view. That's not the case anymore. Now, that doesn't mean that there are no limits, okay? Uh, one of the paintings in Keloides was not exhibited in Havana. Uh, we, we, one of Alexis Esquivel paintings, because that painting, well, that piece, is a, it's a ballot box. It has all the faces of Cuban presidents, all of whom, needless to say, are white. And then it's like a triangle. And at the end of the triangle, there is, there is a, a, a faceless black man. And then, as, as if suggesting that we were going to have our own Barack Obama, right? And then there are, he even paints three little faces of three black uh, individuals, and he gives you the opportunity to vote for one of them. <laughs> one of them is a member, is the only black member of the Politburo, the highest echelon of the Cuban Communist Party, and the other two are dissidents. Are, are members of the, so he gave you some <laughs> variety in the ideology. <laughs> now that, that wouldn't go. Um, the, censors, the censors would pick that one. Uh, but other than something as that explicit, they would, they would allow, they would not. I think there, it's fair to say that in general, Cuban art, which is incredibly vibrant, uh, enjoys uh, a room that was unthinkable 10 or 15 years ago. But you mean the censorship literally? I mean, did they, did they some do. bureaucrat have to look at oh, all yeah. of the oh, pieces well. and go, no way? I think Elio can answer that better yeah. than me. Yeah, yeah tell us about it. How'd you get all your pornographic stuff through that? <laughs> 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 Big that, bananas. And that's not a problem. And banana, <laughs> banana, banana. <laughs> yeah. No, the point is, is, is a game that, that, you, that you as an artist have to know how to play. It's like, uh, depending the recognition you have, depending how much you can push. Mm -hmm. and, but you have to know the limits. Every artist has its own limits, so you have to know how much you have to push, mm -hmm. depending what you want. So it's like, it's a, it's a game. It's a game that you really have to know, and also the other part of the game is, depending the people you are in front, you have to know how to explain your work. Mm -hmm. The same work, you have to be got ready different speeches. One for the government people, one for the uh, possible buyer, or whatever. It's not a uh, lie, it's different truths. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Different truth. Yeah. How, is, how is the University of Pittsburgh reacted to your curatorial hat? Have they been supportive? They have been quite supportive, actually. Without their support, this wouldn't have happened. I think it's, uh, I have to say that, especially because not only because they provided seed money and all that, but also because they, uh, I think they immediately saw that this was an extension of my intellectual work. That this, you know, in the end, this is like a history project. It was sort of recovering these lost exhibits mm -hmm. and then making a contribution to this conversation that is going on in Cuba. So um, it was something different, but um, it was still within the realms of, the, this is well within the realm of my interest. In fact, this is something I'm going to continue doing in the future. Good, uh, some of you don't know that we're, uh, you'll go upstairs to see the Rudenstein Gallery, which is, uh, I'm very proud of that. But we'll be moving, I hope by September, down to the first floor, the ground floor. When you come out on the way up the hill to Pete's Coffee, look at the, the empty space ostensibly for lease. That's now part of the new Du Bois Institute and will be the Cooper Gallery, 3,000 square feet. <laughs> and we got a, a donation from my, um, well, the guy was, I was class of 73 at Yale. It's a black man from Liberia. And Ameri they used to call him Americo Liberians. His family were slaves, they were freed, they left America in 1826, the Cooper family. We met at Yale. We were in the same secret society. I, replicated myself through. I tapped him, we said. And he's fabulously rich. 
and he wanted. <laughs> he came to me um, a week before Christmas, this past Christmas, and he said he wanted his name on a building at Harvard. <laughs> and we had just talked about this idea of expanding the art gallery. And I couldn't believe it was like a gift from God. It was sleeting. I got in his limousine with his chauffeur. We drove over there. I said, Bert, this could be the Cooper Gallery, your name. And he gave us two and a half million dollars. Wow. And the reason I'm mentioning that is to say, amen, amen. But because um, it broke Alejandro's heart not to be able to show the whole exhibition here, but I promise you, that either the first or the second exhibition in the Cooper Gallery will be the whole keloids. Okay. And that is okay, yours. I'll hold it right. <laughs> Rachel, we're going to need your help on that. Okay? No, that's right. We, we're going to do it. Now, the Du Bois Institute owns, uh, Elio, two of your pieces. Um, and I own one over at my house. Um, and you can see the two upstairs in the hall. And his portfolio is also upstairs for you to look at after I do, and I get first, <laughs> first, uh, first choice. Now, <laughs> Elio, can you talk about some of the imagery and ideas that recur throughout your work? Identity and the uh, acting always is identity and, and how the people, all the, stereoty all the stereotypes that the people have about Cuba or to whatever place is like, is, I mean, mainly, I think, what a stereotype that people have about Cuba, because it's the place I, I, I live, but it's not only about Cuba. It's something that you can see in, in any place in the world. People have, people need to box things to mm -hmm. understand it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when you, when you box something, you are losing uh, Always. another part. Always. And it's like, it's, 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 it's funny. It's like, it's game with that. And I'm always asking, that the question is how much Cuban I can be, how much Spanish I can be, how much American, uh, and this thing, this thing that crossing cultures and uh, play with the, the high history, also because because maybe because I'm I'm come from um, a very poor family, I really uh, um, appreciate popular culture mm -hmm. rather than high culture. For me, always I said. A higher culture is too boring for me, mm -hmm. <laughs> and but I really love popular culture. So I, I, I always have playing with 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 the popular. For example, I, I, I prefer. I mean, paint is fine, but make sculpture. I made the kind of sculpture I made because my mother was uh, sewing, was working in a in a sewing, uh, sewing factory. A seamstress. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's the different reason. I mean, carving. I, I never would look myself carving stone. It's not for me. Mm -hmm. It's I mean I prefer popular culture rather than the other one, and and always it's like playing. You have to be, you know. I'm, I love to make jokes, so I'm my eyes are the same joking. But, but you love to make jokes about sex, about everything. No, I know that, that the people <laughs> will see that. <laughs> but <laughs> sex, the interconnection between sex and race and racism, yeah, fundamental theme. Light fears. motif of your I mean, work. most of it's like fears. People have a lot of fears about about stereotypes, mm -hmm. about 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 the image of our, our self, and it's like like playing with that. It's like look, we are not we are not just a danger. It's like like playing with that. Put, putting putting the, the 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 fears in another space to see that 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 is not not so not so, not so much. Mm -hmm. yes. do, do you encounter those stereotypes in Spain? Yeah, sure. To the same degree as in Cuba, which yeah, is sure. the same degree. Mm -hmm. So well, Spain is not better or worse than Cuba in terms of racism. It's the same. It's it's the every, same. every place it has its own demons and, and heroes. It's the same. It's mm. the same. In, 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 in Spain, I'm, I don't, I mean, for example, I don't live in Madrid. I live in, in Elche, in a mm -hmm. little town in the, in the east. And I remember when, I, when we first get there, everybody was looking like, ooh. Because <laughs> I, live in, I live in the downtown, you know, very white. Place and everybody was scaring. That, Who's that guy? <laughs> uh, and it's and it's raking. It's like like for example, my wife my wife is white. It's like some some people are saying, and how do you do that? <laughs> is she? <laughs> Why is, not? Is, is, she like Span a is she Spanish or Cuban? No, she's Spanish. That's Spanish. the reason. And Spain. Uh -huh. It would be an Indian. That would be an Indian. It's, oh yeah, I got you. It's, <laughs> it's not. I mean, you you. It's like nothing. Everything is, is negotiable. Everything is, is, 
can be mixed yeah. and everything anything is pu is pure mm -hmm. and in art the good thing i always say about art is we make our own rules so mm -hmm. why not to change things the way they are the thing are well the, as you'll see upstairs the heart of the exhibition in a sense is the black seba could you tell us about about that, its imagery, its uh, history, its importance? Well, that came because in 1990, I think, uh, we may, I make um, 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 sculpture that was kind of an homage of with Fedolan in Cuba. The, the name was La, uh, the, La, uh, La Jungla, the jungle. That is kind of the, um, the main, the most important image of the Cuban art. That the funny thing, that, that painting is in the MoMA, it's not in Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, so I tried to make my homage to that, that lamp because in some way I think it was a beautiful painting, but also it's because I, I saw more, I want to see more than the normal people saw in the painting. So I, what I did was make it, make it a sculpture. The, the original painting is, uh, is, I mean, is flat and bidimensional, uh, have a lot of colors, so I made it white. And I made a sculpture, so I mean, a, a, a subsculpture. Try to put in the first level thing that usually was hiding, like the sensuality, the, uh, the, the 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 love for the shapes, and try to put in a in a some contemporary language, that, uh, a piece that was from from 1940 something. Mm -hmm. So, I think it was a I think it was a good piece. Mm -hmm. at, the, at that moment, the National Museum don't want to buy it. So after that, an English man, he bought it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and after that, it was something time passed, and I want to make something different. But at that, but at that time, I, I was time thinking that I want to make a, um, a second version, but more, more talking about um, um, the, the black uh, men. So for me, Seiba is like a, uh, like a heart, the heart of, of the Cuban culture, also the African culture. It's like our baobab. Mm -hmm. Every every Latin city has been built in a shadow by the shadow of the, of the Seiba, and for Cuban have a lot of meaning, uh, religious, cultural, social. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like the center of. For me, the Seiba is Cuba. It's mm -hmm. everything is is in the Seiba. You mm -hmm. can put anything. In a say, but that would remain the. So you think it's like a baobab in Africa? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. yeah. and also when I was, was looking at Ravana, I realized that we got a lot of uh, tree growing from 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 the walls. Mm -hmm. You can you can have you can have, you can have big uh, trees. So that tricked me in the way that it was something disturbing, something wild, growing from from a, the flat. Uh, space of a, of a building that is very cool. So that the one I want, you know, in some way create something that was disturbing in that, in that way. Hmm. So I made a sculpture, I had the opportunity in Spain to make a, a show, so I make, I make the, the piece. And well, Ruben, he was one of them that was cool. Yeah, in a few minutes you'll see it. Yeah. Yeah. Alejandro, you? You took a degree in law in, in Cuba, mm -hmm. and then you took a PhD in history at Pittsburgh mm -hmm. under um, my good friend uh, Reed Andrews. Mm -hmm. And how many years have you lived in the States now? Since 1992. How would you characterize as an objective uh, outsider the difference between anti-black racism <coughs> in Cuba and anti-black racism in the United States? Well, OK. so. The first thing is that, of course, the first thing uh, an ordinary Cuban would say is that compared to the US, there is no racism in Cuba. Needless to say, I am not going to say that, right? <laughs> um, but the, it does feel very different at the same time. It doesn't mean that, uh, I mean, there is racism in Cuba, but racism can manifest itself in many different ways. And in Cuba, it does feel different. And it feels very different because it doesn't lead, you know, to use Eddie Tellis' uh, wonderful work in, in Cuba. Eddie Tellis is a sociologist at Princeton. Horizontally, you don't you don't see major differences. People live in the same neighborhoods. The, 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 the degree of integration seems to be much higher than the degree of integration you experience in and America. And they marry each other. 
Uh, they, they do marry each other. Uh, they live closer to each other, especially in the lower classes. The interactions are fairly intense. And people in the lower classes seem to experience uh, such important uh, obstacles to mobility in general that race sort of loses a little bit of its, uh, its salience and importance in daily life and daily interactions. I think the best way to, to, to answer your question is by saying what I felt when I came to this country when I was already a scholar of race and slavery. And that what really shocked me about American society and some somehow sealed my fate, I mean, I knew that I would be working on race for the rest of my life after coming here, was the degree of separation, of physical separation. Just walking around campus and seeing that groups were looked very homogeneous to me. Uh, for somebody who came from the Caribbean, that looked terribly foreign. Uh, and it took me a while to understand those dynamics and to learn about the history of this country and to understand uh, to put the, that reality into some sort of historical and sociological context. Uh, but that is a very stark difference, which matters because in daily life, uh, we could be, we are in Cuba brutally racist in, in jokes, in comments, in all kinds of ways. But people do go to bed together, they do drink together. They live together, and that also, so, so life is, is, is felt uh, in somewhat different ways. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. It does. Elio, what do you think? Yeah. We yeah. talked about it briefly, but could you? Yeah, but uh, as I said, I mean, normal Cuba, or no, no, wait, normal Cuba in a point, because also was a moment in the government say that it was not good to talk about it. Normal Cuba have the, have the, the sense that there is no race in Cuba, but the, the, the normal life, when you start to talk with the people, yeah, there is. I mean, um, I mean, I remember when I was a student. I was every every day, like at least like three times, pol the police stuck uh, stuck me on the street. I remember. I remember one time with Pedro Alvarez in, in the street. We was drinking beer around. I was a patrol uh, car patrol came and asked me the, my ID. I remember Pedro said, "Why not me?" I mean, Pedro was a white mm -hmm. like. He was, why him? Why not me? We are doing the same thing on the, on the park. And it was because I was the danger. It's always the danger. And also the way we talk. Kima, the, 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 the phrase in the popular culture is really, really racist. Mm -hmm. The way we talk about the hair, about the skin, about relationship. Mm -hmm. And actually the, the funny thing or the worst thing is people does not mean it. I mean, they can, they can say the worst thing in the world but they say, no, I don't mean to be rude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's no, I understand. Mm. The, um, in, when I made my Cuban film, it was occurring, I had to sum up what I'd seen. And um, the biggest difference, and it just spontaneously occurred to me, that every black person, I interviewed dozens of black Cubans. Every black Cuban I interviewed said, I'm a Cuban who happens to be black. Every black American I know says I'm black and I happen to be an American, which is very, very different. What do you see as the, and I have my own theories about this because I go down to see you know, Marielle as much as I can. Fortunately, she's here. And I stay at a five-star hotel. And so I'm seeing the tourist industry. And I'm paying with kooks or dollars, you know, which are very wealthy. And most of the people who would serve me in the Paladars, which you know, the upscale private restaurants or the hotels, are white mm -hmm. Cubans mm -hmm. who are making more money a week than a professor of history at the University of Vienna is making in a year. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the uh, implications of the rebirth of capitalism on the island? Because capitalism has come. It's coming. And it's coming more and more every day in its own way. What are the implications of that on race relations? Do you think the people who got money would take it, would take advantage of that? That the people they don't they want and so give up people who got money are white. Mm -hmm. That's it. So the system has come back to haunt even yeah, sure. after the revolution. Yeah. So wait. Well, it's a. Are you more optimistic? It's, a, it's a hugely complicated question, as you know. Um, of, of course. I am not very optimistic about it. In fact, uh, I think some of the um, some of the um, 
reforms that ha are being implemented now. For instance, about three weeks ago, to give you one concrete example, about three or four weeks ago, the Cuban government took an important and, and, and useful step, and that is that for the first time, they have authorized private uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, small owners, small business owners, to use houses as collateral to ask for um, uh, loans. Okay, you know what's coming next, right? No, but explain that because most of us don't realize that Cubans can own a house. Well, yeah. Most Cubans, not, of course, most Cubans do not, cannot own a house, but especially those Cubans who do own a house tend to be overwhelmingly white and have much better houses because of historic discrimination, because of historic inequality. Therefore, a measure which is racially neutral, right? This measure has nothing to do with race, is going to have a very concrete uh, racial impact. It's going to magnify differences even further. Now, the question then becomes, why on earth, why is it that there is nobody in the government sort of raising flags and saying, wait a second, this is going to have uh, unforeseen consequences, or maybe that is happening, and the leadership, and I do not know the answer to that, to be frank, and the leadership is saying, well, too bad, but we have to do it anyways. Mm -hmm. What I do not see, and, and that's why I'm not optimistic, because I see that these reforms are being implemented, and I don't see, I don't see any kind of policy design to counteract uh, some of the social, uh, what I would characterize as undesirable uh, social effects or uh, side effects of some of these policies. If they, therefore, if these reforms continue to be implemented, racial differences will only continue to grow, and they are massive already. Mm -hmm. They are very massive already. Mm. Um, let's open it up. Alvin's telling me wrap it up. We can open it, open it up to questions from, uh, but I have one more question. Mr. Alvin, Mr. Carter, can I ask him one more question? Post, I know Fidel's going to live forever. Yeah, sure. There are a million jokes in Cuba about Fidel living for longer than Methuselah, right? But sooner or later, Fidel has to go. What do you see? Do you, you, you see dramatic change post-Fidel, or will it be more the same? Elio de Alejandro. Then we'll idea. open it up. I have no idea. I think in one, mainly that depends on the government, but I don't, I don't, I never understand them on, on all sorts of fact I don't live there now. I don't know. I don't know. Mm. I hope, I would love that be some slow, well done uh, transition to a uh, not equal equalitarian, but some a uh, good society when everybody have at least the right to build something. But I don't know. Mm. Alejandro, Fidel is gone. Fidel is not in the picture really anymore, and. Nobody in Cuba talks about Fidel, only in the U.S. do we keep talking about Fidel. Fidel is out. Fidel is in his house. He still has some influence. Whenever they show him in public, it's an embarrassment. <laughs> it's almost painful, frankly, uh, to, to but watch. His, but his brother runs it. His brother runs it, but who is much more pragmatic than him and actually has begun to, imp to take some steps to make that sort of slow transition. He doesn't have much time, I mean, because he's 80 years old. His vice president is 82, mm -hmm. so <laughs> not, much, not much hope there either, right? Um, so the question is whether they're going to have time to implement uh, enough of these changes. Uh, I don't think so. Cuba will, not, will never be the same as it was under Fidel Castro, like in the glory years of the revolution. Mm -hmm. things, will, things will change, but things are fast changing already on the ground in Cuba. If you go to Havana now, it's one business after another. I mean, everybody is selling something. Piñatas, jewelry. Uh, I say piñatas because they're everywhere, you know. Um, hey, the right to buy. You know product. what? You, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. And yeah. out, out of the Santeria stores, you know, now the ritual objects, mm -hmm. they are everywhere in Havana. These things were prohibited uh, 20 years ago. Nobody would ever. So mm -hmm. if you walk through Havana, it's actually changing a lot on, on the ground. While politically it seems frozen, and it seems that nothing is changing, there is actually a lot of change happening on the ground already. Yeah, but the point is that those people who run the country, they are interested. They, they are raised a fortune because the country the way they are. I don't think they will allow to somebody take uh, the money. 
-hmm. they will, they will, I think they want to preserve the thing they want. And uh, uh, by the other hand, is I see in Cuba is a lot of uh, 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 raising uh, a group of people very well, uh, very well uh, money, but actually are people who are very close from the government. If you if you want to have money in Cuba, you have to be close to the government. That's mm -hmm. the only that's the only way. Mm -hmm. If you are, if you have money in Cuba, and you are not close to the government. They will find some way to take away your money. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. That's the bottom line. That's for sure. Um, I said one more question, but I, I can't I can't open it up in the hip hop archive without asking you a question about hip hop. I end my film with um, Sol Andres, mm -hmm. who is um, leading hip hop star, whose lyrics critique racism in Cuba. You ended your lecture at Harvard, your splendid lecture at Harvard, a few months ago, talking about. So Andre said, hip hop, is hip hop um, a positive form for social change, economic and racial in Cuba? I think so. I mean, they, they, they move by re really the, uh, the, uh, the crowds in Cuba. People love them. Young people love them. So mm -hmm. I think uh, they are doing the best thing they can, they want. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Um, it has become a major force, a major cultural force, a major social movement. Uh, it's, uh, it's been running parallel with this visual arts movement uh, and there is actually some crossing there. We created a crossing with our exhibit in Pittsburgh. That was mm -hmm. one of my dreams. One of the visual artists, uh, Roberto Diago, has says that what he does is that he paints raps. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how close these two things are. They are a major force and they will continue to be a major force, I think, for change. Uh, for and no, no censorship? To them? Ah, well, <laughs> you didn't ask that first. Um, <laughs> it depends. It's on and off. Uh, they have, I think they, it's fair to say that they have gained a space. What the Cuban, what the Cuban uh, cultural authorities have done is very interesting. They have created a, a national agency of rap. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, they have tried <laughs> to incorporate in very old fashion, the, to, to incorporate uh, in the political sense of the term, this movement. <laughs> into the fold that has created some opportunities and some challenges as you can imagine um, but the but the bottom line is I think is that the artists the, the, the hip hop artists continue to do their work sometimes within the agency sometimes outside the agency and they haven't found a way a formula to shut them uh, up they, they they're still they're still singing they're still yelling they're still asking for change and they still uh, continue to have a large following in the Cuban youth. The most uh, uh, challenge they got, at, I mean, not, not only them, any, any intellectual in Cuba, is not be uh, shy with the money, with the market. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the, 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 the most important challenge, I think, that the hip hop people in Cuba have, because they, because they can make a, lo a lot of money, the, the lyrics and, and the position and their they mind can be well, be cheap. Like, mm -hmm. no, they start to talk about not so much important thing. That Commercialized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the most important thing for me. But this is not only for rap people, it's for any kind of people. Of course. Person. Even visual artists. Sure. That's <laughs> great. Yeah. Let's open it up. First of all, give it up for both of these. Now, questions and comments. Marcelina Morgan. Well, I just want, want to interrupt for a second and say that the um, overflow room is as many people and people will be coming in to ask questions. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. See, we have our new gallery. It'll be uh, big what, enough for everything. What is the overflow room, anyways? <laughs> oh, behind us. Yeah, just, we well, I'm here. sorry. So. Okay. Hey, I questions, have, comment. Yeah, Linda, Haywood, Linda Haywood's professor of uh, African history. Chair of African and African American Studies at Boston University. Yeah, and in fact, uh, I was privileged to, in fact, go to Cuba last spring for the first time. And I'm teaching a course this semester on uh, governance, leadership, and power in Africa and the Caribbean, Cuba being one of my countries. So I've been reading a lot, including your book I'm using. And what, I, what, I, what intrigued me as I get into this in the sort of revolutionary period and I will come to the contemporary period comparing the Cuban-Angolan situation because Q Angola and Cuba are two of my countries, was first of all the issue of race in the beginnings of the revolution. 
And this, uh, it came very strongly to me when I was reading about Quentin Bandera, I think, who in fact was court-martialed because he did not live up to the sort of military, you know, white military uh, behavior, even though his white office, his white colleagues were in fact doing the same, like living with concubines during the, you know, period of the war. And I wondered in terms of visual artists, how is a figure like Quentin Bandera, kind of a, how are you going to reconceptualize him, you know, as you did the uh, Cespedes, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, so I wondered how much history, how much of that history do the young, you know, um, hip hop or the young visual artists know about that really crucial period when Cubans were talking about Cubanidad mm -hmm. and the whole racial identity was really a crucial part of that. And the American kind of a inroads into shape, reshaping that into a more racialized American racial lens than, in fact, Cuban racial lens. So if you can respond to that, it, w it would really be helpful. Good. Who wants right. that? Alan? So um, it's too bad I don't have an image of a, of a wonderful, first of all, we should have Ada Ferrer here to talk about Quintin Banderas, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't have Ada. Um, she's a major specialist on, on this period and on this figure uh, and a dear friend. Um, that I don't have an image um, of a wonderful installation of Alexis Esquivel, mm -hmm. which is called, I can email it to you, which is called Pianissimo uh, Concierto en Clave de IFA, uh -huh. so Piano yeah. Concert in IFA, uh, John, in which he, he, what he does is that he has like a broken, What he's suggesting is that even though the Cuban narrative has been, uh, has been put together through the image of the piano, right, the Western influence, there is another Cuba in Clave de Ifa. You know, if you look at this other Cuba, there is a, an alternative uh, genealogy of our history. And people like Quintin Banderas are become absolutely central to that other narrative. So, so that's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that some of the raperos, some of the hip hop musicians are also talking about forgotten historical figures. To mention one quick and easy example, um, they've been talking about 1912 and the, and the, and, and the killings of 19, a massacre, a racist massacre that took place in Cuba in 1912. They've been talking about this. I love the one line of our friend So Andres who says, la escuela no habla de los independientes de color. Schools don't talk about the independent party of color. So they've also been working to uh, rethink uh, uh, Cuban history along precisely the lines that you're suggesting. Yeah, one of the, th one of the things that's interesting about the um, so-called Spanish-American War, which I learned is in Cuba, it's called the Cuban-Spanish-American War, is that, um, well, according to Ada, maybe 60% of the Cuban army was black. And Cuba was going to win without American intervention, which is one of the reasons America wanted to intervene, because you had all these black soldiers. You know, it was very, very complicated. And um, the, so there was great expectation with independence. And the American occupation lasts until 1902. The Americans leave. So there's an expectation of racial democracy, which is, doesn't work out. So 1908, black men form the Independent Party of Color and make demands. And by 1912, they're crushed in this huge massacre, which approximately, well, officially 3,000 people, right? But it's, um, um, were killed. Du Bois had Ar Arturo Schomburg write about it for um, the crisis. So it was very much a, a, a pan-African awareness of the significance of race uh, in Cuba, very, very complicated. And it's something that, as I understand it, was suppressed in terms of Cuban history. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, it was very much suppressed to the point that it was a non-event in most history books until very recently. It's only 1912 has become something of a banner, a proxy to rethink uh, Cuban history and to rethink uh, the place of blacks in Cuban history. Mm. Questions, comments? Yes. Um, my name is Michelle Wojcik. I actually have two um, art galleries specifically focused on Cuban art in uh, the South End in Boston and also in Provincetown. So uh, I hope what are that they you called? can attend. Galleria Cubana. Oh, great. So oh, yeah. I hope you can come while you're here. Yeah. 
Um, but I actually get challenged on this point quite a bit, which is, <laughs> excuse me, about censorship. And um, I say similar to what Alejandro said, which is, you know, more or less there's a lot more freedom than most people think in the arts, um, which is an amazing thing for the country, um, but it has its limi limitations. But I was wondering if you could speak to more about um, just a few minutes on the history of censorship, which I find quite interesting, starting from the 70s in the Soviet period, and, and particularly how uh, historical Volumen Uno was in, um, in where we are today in art. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Elio? Censorship is, I mean, I think censorship in Cuba are really, we take aware of that, I think mostly in the 80s, but mostly um, 85, because at the beginning of the 80s, I mean, volume will have, volume will have some problem, but not, I don't think, so it's not so much censorship. Censorship became when some people start to cross the line, like for example, Thomas Exxon, this black, wonderful painter. He made, it was a paradigmatic moment that he made a, a portrait, beautiful portrait of Che Guevara, but in the way he painted, was a, co a couple, um, making love in front of the Che Guevara uh, painting, and the show was, was censorship. After, uh, that was the moment when, when, because always censorship in Cuba was like a phrase that, that doesn't happen in Cuba. Mm. But up, up to that moment, the government or the people who make rule, they say, no, that's it. I mean, we won't negotiate. <laughs> we will stop, we will, we will take your work and take off. And I remember it was a moment when, when strategy was if you remove one one work the whole show will be uh, uh, shut down mm. and was also I mean a sample as the uh, a project uh, Castillo de la Fuerza the Force Castle mm -hmm. a project that uh, to Iraq it was essentially before, before it even opened uh, well, I mean like it was was uh, after 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 Tomat everybody was censorship mm -hmm. was like was it like, like a game like I already, I make a, a word so strong that I have to be censorship. It was a moment when if you don't, if you don't, if it's nobody censorship you, you're not so good. <laughs> it was a moment like that. It was like pushing. I mean, the point was to push so, so hard. After the night, it, that changed. The night it was like, well, we already know that we don't, we, we won't change anything. We have to leave. We are an artist in the limits of heart. We are strong, so start to play. We will start to play. Mm -hmm. yeah, my understanding was the Soviets were putting you know, a lot of pressure. Um, Soviet? The oh. Soviets were putting pressure on Cubans, uh, basically, uh, to, in art, not in art. particularly in the arts. Uh, and I, yeah. this is very interesting because, in fact, you don't see history of this written places. That's why um, you know, I try to talk to people who were around in that period um, because I'm just really curious about that question. Um, but you don't think so? You don't think the same? Well, not my experience. Uh, Lucian, no. I, some, I, some, I, some teacher at school, but... I think you're making reference to the years um, uh, of realist socialism in Cuban art in the 1970s, which was identified with Soviet influences, in which uh, Cuban authorities became very critical of any other form of art, uh, including uh, for Cuban art, especially those uh, um, um, work on Santeria or African influences in Cuban art. That's in the 1970s. Then there is an opening, a gradual opening in the 1980s uh, with some dramatic moments. You know, in 1991, for instance, Angel Delgado is sent to jail for six months for doing a performance. Uh, he took a grandma newspaper, the official newspaper, and took it to the exhibit, uh, surrounded himself with little note cards, and then defecated on grandma. That was the performance. <laughs> they weren't happy. And, <laughs> you know, that you would defecate on the official party newspaper, which was the newspaper. There wasn't another one. So they sent him to jail. I mean, he spent six months in jail. The, trust me, this man is not a criminal. I mean, if you met him, you would see that he doesn't belong in jail. But that was 1991. Then um, the, 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 there is a process in which the government begins to, 
the, the, it has no choice but to allow more and more room uh, for the artists to, to express themselves. And one thing that happens is that many artists began to begin to move to leave Cuba without really living forever. They, they live, they spend time outside, and something of an unwritten pact takes, takes place, which is, you know, you can do your stuff if you don't speak directly against Fidel Castro, if you don't, you know, as they say in Cuba, you can play with the chain, just don't touch the monkey, you know, just, mm -hmm. um, there, there is some room, I like that. But, there is, but there are some things that you cannot do. You know, Toirac had, for instance, uh, a wonderful piece, which was a collection of portraits of Cuban presidents. And he was going to show this in the National Museum uh, of Art. And it was, a, uh, it, it, it was kind of an installation with all the paintings. He painted each of the presidents. Uh, he was not happy for it. Uh, by the way, when he had to paint Raul, he said, well, I thought I was done with this. <laughs> <laughs> it was all of them side by side, and then at the very end, there was uh, a nail on the, on the wall. That was the, that was the piece, you know, all these portraits and just a nail, as if suggesting that after Fidel, there would be another portrait, that this was not the end of history for Cuba. That, was, that could not be shown in Cuba. <laughs> and cold. the Minister of Culture told him personally, told him, look, if we show this, I'll lose the, my job. There's no way <laughs> we're going to get away with this. So that piece could not be seen in Havana. It was uh, shown uh, here in the United States, uh, where it is now. So even today, there are some limits. But there is considerable more freedom today uh, to do work, to do art in Cuba than, than in 1991 when Angel uh, was sent to jail. But they didn't burn the piece. They just didn't let it be exhibited, right? They didn't burn the piece. Yeah. No, they never, they didn't do anything to the piece. They just told him. They actually almost begged him, you know, don't even try to show this yeah. because it's or not going to fly. Or take the nail out. <laughs> or maybe take the nail out. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Daly Guerrero. I'm a sophomore at the college. Uh, I'm from the Dominican Republic. And I think that in the Dominican Republic, there's a lot of negation of black ancestry. Most people are likely to identify as Indio, Indio. At, rather than black. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if in Cuba, do Afro-Cubans try to assimilate into, black, into white culture? Or what are some ways that they show pride in being black? Elio. I think it's different ways. I mean, some people try to, to get into the white culture. But I mean, may, uh, maybe. Um, my point of view, I think, is right, right now is a, a growing consciousness on people to, to look at our, our tradition, I think, mainly. Also, I have to say this, uh, my, my point of view is uh, intellectual people, people like me. I'm maybe people from the uh, Bay, people who work in the farm, they don't, I mean, if you work on the farm, you don't care about who you are. You just want to eat. That's a fact, but I think that mainly it's a it's a it's a, it's a growing uh, movement now. But I'm not so sure. Can let me, you can you teach? Let, let me let me add something okay, very ahead. briefly about sure. this, which is these images. One of the big themes within this movement uh, is uh, something of a, a, a big reflection about Africa and the centrality of Africa in Cuban life, uh, which speaks directly to your question. Uh, we didn't get to talk about that. But this is something of a concern among many uh, intellectuals in Cuba now, how to, how to uh, as an Afro-Cuban uh, writer, uh, Teresa de Cárdenas has said, um, she says, Africa is everything I am about, all that I ignore. There is an emphasis to try to rethink this history and to try to um, recover this history, which is also a major, a major theme in, in, in the work of the Keloides group. Mm -hmm. And she lives in Boston, of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 She's, yeah. Our good, she's our good friend. But um, when the, at our big conference of Black and Latin America here last January, uh, Miguel Barnett said, it was very interesting his talk, but he, he said that, um, and he said it in the film, that getting African American, African history in the schools would be a, a radical change. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, yes, sure. Because it's not there now. Nothing. It's not there now. It's not only. It's, it's not there. It's not only not there in terms of history. You know, we read uh, Baudelaire, mm -hmm. we read Jean-Jacques Rousseau, mm -hmm. uh, 
Nobody in Cuba has ever read, uh, well, there are a few anthologies of African okay. uh, literature and stuff, but none, none of that is taught in schools. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not just history, but in culture in general, uh, literature, zero. Mm -hmm. We have time for a couple more questions before we do what we uh, are all meant to do here, which is go look at art. Oh, thank you. Hi. And actually, the question, uh, well, my name is Odette Casamayor. I, I work at the University of Connecticut near here. Hello. And the question actually is for Elio. And uh, well, I, I think you talked that uh, in your next works, you want to uh, continue to approach black masculinity. I think it's yeah. one of the things you've said, uh, specifically related to those uh, um, works uh, about the Seba, so the, uh, like the Cuban baobab and uh, uh, also related to the shapes, the uh, body shapes in uh, the jungle. So you are a version of the jungle. So my question is why the uh, black Cuban man, beyond the fact that you are a black Cuban man, uh, mostly what is your um, approach on the um, black masculinity, Cuban black masculinity, and what is the messages or the ideas that you want to um, uh, inscribe in your, in your work? Um, as usually, I, I'm laughing about all the uh, cliches. I mean, all the matches in Cuba, I'm thinking it's stupid. And, and at the point, I mean, that the, that the reason I myself, I put it as, sometimes as a woman, I put it, I mean, the, the, the uh, character can be, I, I treat the character like moving in different space and, and, and moments, because I think I have to laugh, the thing I don't, I don't I don't believe, I don't believe in masculinity at all. I mean, I don't believe in anything actually. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, so I think we have to be strong enough to, to laugh at ourselves. That, uh, I mean, that's the only way I know to know me or know the thing I have around me. So that, that because I'm trying to talk uh, about that subject. Hmm. Final question. My name is uh, Roger Falcon. I'm a friend Could of the. Could you stand up, please? Okay. My name is Roger Falcon. I'm a friend of the institute as well as a Cuban American, and my question was uh, related to the great black Cuban poet Nicolas Guillén, who uh, started out supporting the revolution until he became disillusioned by it, largely largely due to the race and racism that he saw in it, and I was wondering. Um, what is his impact today? Do the younger generation of artists know about Guillain and his work? Do they, do they refer to his work, and if so, how? Uh, the rapper, the music, that's a bit of unfolding. There is, a, there is a, a wonderful song. Do you know the song Tango by Hermano de Causa, by the rap? That's how influential Guillain is, although, of course, the song is a direct response to Guillain's uh, beautiful poem. Guillain's poem is a 1964 poem. It's a, it's a, it sings to the to the to the truly incredible <coughs> achievements of the Cuban revolutionary uh, government. If you look at them in 19, the 1960s context, but then of course come these young uh, raperos in the 1990s and say, "I don't really have what Guillén says that I should have." So Guillén is very much it's, it's it's very much part of the conversation about race and racism in Cuba. And if there is one figure, one literary figure that Cubans uh, know is Nicolas Guillén. Um, I don't know how deep that knowledge is. Maybe Marial knows this better than me uh, at the university. But uh, what I can tell you is that it is part of the conversation. And you see then Guillén's name used for all kinds of purposes all the time. And it's also a reference, uh, for example, also to Iraq, he made a beautiful video about tango, the same. Because the, that poem is like um, an icon of what mm -hmm. Cuba was expecting of the revolution. Yeah. And that also a, a reference of the Cuban art, that Toira made a wonderful video. He, he used uh, those people who, uh, with the, uh, the mudos, with the, dumb, with the language of the, uh, the, the mudo, como se dice mudo? Tanto. Mute. No, 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 but it's not. He's saying people who have difficulty speaking, no, right? No, like, you know, that's that language. Ah, that's, okay. Oh, yeah. So, Toira, sign, he, sign language. Sign language. Uh, sign. Toira, Toira took it one guy of that, and he, in the video, you just see somebody making movement. Mm -hmm. 
and at the end he just put tango at the end you have it's like like ah. the way he think uh -huh. is tango is right now abstraction because mm -hmm. nothing happened mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen let's thank alejandro de la Fuente. Elio Rodriguez. Thank you.